uh, there, we have a space agency like the UK and um, the objective I think is the same it's to, uh, to increase science and uh, engineering technology higher education students uh, at the moment we have 28% uh, people that, that are in, in higher education in science and technology and we want to increase to, to f uh, f 35 and we want to increase um, PhD students from 561 to 3000 uh, in the next few years per year so quite a task but uh, our first attempt is not that well known to everybody and that was Greenset in the days of the Cold War it was a project that was, um, was sort of like I think ITAR didn't exist yet because it was between the US and South Africa and we were building a rocket and we were building a uh, Earth observation satellite the Cold War ended and then all of a sudden the lawmakers couldn't distinguish the difference between a, a Earth observation satellite being launched and a rocket that could launch warheads. So the project was abruptly ended and yeah, the facilities are still there and uh, it was used, uh, some, of the, some of the big integrating facilities are, are still intact, they're kept intact and we are now going to start using that for other satellites. And yeah, they're also talking about building another launch facility. Um, so Modela said the amateur payload was built in record time. They were, we were given three months. They said if you wanna you you wanna be on SS67, then you know be ready in three months. Uh, it ne necessitated us to not be able to to build a transponder, but to piggyback on an existing transponder and build just sort of like a control board that would do the necessary things and control the tones and all the activities that we needed. That was done and it was built and finished and it was all ready to go and then the long, long delay started. The, the launch was originally organized uh, uh, on a steel rocket uh, facility in Russia from a, from a uh, submarine uh, but somehow, you know, these international treaties have little small print somewhere. And ultimately, between the uh, Russian government and the Russian Navy, they couldn't see eye to eye and never happened, was put off, put off. Then the two presidents, uh, the Russian president and the South African president, who was stubborn Becky at the time, met together and our president said to the Russian president, Guy, we have a treaty, a science treaty, where you are supposed to be sorting our, uh, supporting our science missions. So that caused an embarrassment in the Russian government and then they quickly got the act together after all that and they organized the launch from Bakunur. And uh, that happened in, in quite quick time after they, they had that they had a discussion in April and the launch was supposed to be July and then of course it got delayed because the Russian satellite, uh, which um, nobody wants to know, well, we're supposed to know what it was, but uh, we think it's definitely a spy satellite, <laughs> it certainly wasn't anything else. Uh, that um, that was not not ready, so the launch got quite quite a bit delayed until September. But there it went. It ultimately took off, and this is just a very short video of actually uh, how it was launched and how the, uh, the some Mandela set was was separated from the main structure. I'll cut it quite short. Uh, it's quite a lengthy video. Uh, it's available on the web, but it's available on, on YouTube and everywhere else. When you see that picture, you think the whole lot got into up in flames. <laughs> it's quite interesting, um, the animation of, of how they launched the, the various satellites on that particular mission. There were quite a few on there.
Now you wonder why there's so much space debris. I look at all the rubbish they they just throw away. That was the main payload. And there goes the one. Another one, and there go we. Right, so interestingly, it, it, after launch, it, it only uh, it was about less than an hour before we actually heard the first signals coming over South Africa. And um, yeah. It wasn't without problems, but uh, the main payload is is an imager, and the uh, this was a picture from uh, the imager, one of the later pictures, which shows the um, the, the river near the East London on the east coast of South Africa. <coughs> but it was not without problems. After launch, the frequency had shifted. We still don't know why. We were supposed to be 880. We eventually ended up 875, and a downlink also to 435, 345. And then we have the activation tones, um, and they operate as, as published. But the uh, the beacon's not operational. The the beacon has a voice of a young man that uh, that uh, says this is ZS ZS zero uh, S U M and some uh, Mandela for some Mandela said. Incidentally, somebody asked me some Mandela said may means um, a pathfinder. It's a it's a superior word. One of the other 11 languages that we have in South Africa and uh, the other problem is with the with the satellite itself uh, there are three reaction wheels uh, to, to stabilize it and two of them failed pretty quickly after after launch but they're still managing uh, with all the other things that they're doing they're still managing uh, thanks they're still managing to uh, to actually position the satellite and, and use the imager quite successfully all right, new operating procedure. Because we had some problems with the amateur payload, there's a new operating procedure. The PTT of the transmitter now stays on for the duration of the payload activation, which the payload is activated for 15 minutes at a time. So it basically would we'll, we'll cover a, a pass over, over, over the, say, parts of Europe for 15 minutes. And it's regardless of a, a valid transmitter tone received. Note that this does not get rid of the cutoff problem. And the cutoff problem was <coughs> when... Um, when people didn't observe the, the three second delay that you're supposed to have between uh, different, it's almost like a repeater. They say take a, you know, take, take a short uh, break or a one or two second break for somebody else to give a chance to break in. So basically is, is that uh, it does not get rid of the cutoff problem, nor the requirement to embed a valid tone when you want to use the payload. So you have to put that, that, uh, uh, that PLT tone in, in, in your transmission. And the following example depicts the ideal uh, scenario on how to use it. As the satellite comes over the horizon, an unmodulated carrier will be received on, on UHF. The person A starts to transmit on VHF with a valid responding tone embedded in the transmission. And uh, the tone is 233.6. And the transmission is relayed in UHF. When the person A releases the PTT, SS67 will continue to transmit what it's receiving. Usually, of course, that will be noise for a further three seconds. Nobody should start to transmit during this time. At the end of the three second period, the unmodulated carrier will be heard. Only when the unmodulated carrier is heard should person B start to transmit. And here is an MP3 recording just of a very brief QSO that illustrates how, how it actually works. So you could hear you could hear the, uh, the the noise came up after he finished, and then you waited three seconds. The other guy started talking, and it worked perfectly. But of course, they still had the embedded tone, and and they must have a pretty good uh, 300, 300 hertz cutoff 
uh, uh, filter in the, in, in the system because, you know, you, you, you don't even hear the faintest or have the faintest idea of a tone. But a uh, couple of people in Europe have already tried it like that and uh, it, it, it seems to work quite well. It was on this morning uh, while over the UK whether or not anybody was outside to work it, I don't know. SX67 can support 150 minute slot per orbit. One orbit per day on weekdays and two orbits per day on Saturday and Sundays will be dedicated to Southern Africa. And I'll be looking at a schedule and that's where your input is required. What we want to do is this, we want to have a rolling schedule. And what, what we're looking for is for a dedicated person in each part of the world to, to work out a schedule for a month for their particular area. And now how we want to do this is to say, okay, first week we will target North South America. Second week in the month, we will target Europe. Third week in the month, the Middle, Middle East, like India. There's a big uh, uh, interest in India and a lot of, lot of reports from there. And then the last week, uh, Australasia, or, or basically uh, Japan and Australia, New Zealand. Now, the suggestion from this group, the individual people I've spoken to, they all say Ip is the right guy. <laughs> To, uh, to take on the job and, and everybody believes that he, he would take on the job. Now I haven't approached him because you guys may have another idea. But we believe that at least that way you know that on the second week of each month, you, if you want to play with SS67, you can play with SS67 because it will be on and on the website www.mzsa.org.za will be the, the uh, planned schedule. Now, because it's a planned schedule, it may not necessarily always happen because they have other payloads. And sometimes, you know, uh, like right now, it's an eclipse. So if the, the imager has, has just, uh, just taken too much of the power, they may skip the next uh, SO67 pass uh, and not operate it. So it's just a guide. It's not necessary to say because the schedule says it will be there, that it necessarily will be there every time. But, yeah, try the next pass. And... Uh, if you have a special event, like you have a school event or something like it, uh, because remember it also has a, the parrot on there. The parrot operates very well. It has a separate tone, as I showed you earlier. So if you if you have a special event, then you drop an email about two weeks before your event to samset at intercom.co.za, and we will then try and schedule it and we'll confirm that it's scheduled for that event, and uh, it will then be put into the diary. The satellite is being controlled, not by us by the Satellite Application Center of the uh, Council for Scientific and Industrial Research at uh, the place called RTBS Hook. Incidentally, they operate about, there's about 50 satellites around the world which they are actually uh, commanding from that particular site on behalf of other operators. And SO67, this happens to be one of them as well. Because it's not our satellite, we only just mark like a little squatter on there. So, do you think it was the right choice for Europe? Any other suggestions? Then I'll send him an email and ask him. So you know to complain if, if, if the orbits he puts in are not right. <laughs> you have to make sure he does it for the following pass. But if you have a special event, then you directly come to us. And uh, obviously, it will drop one of the other passes you know, on that day uh, to be able to accommodate. But uh, we always believe that like, uh, because it's an easy satellite to operate especially for a special event in a school or a a kind of any, any any event that you do, you know, it should take preference to promote amateur radio. Hans, is the schedule going to be promulgated? The schedule will be on the SAMZ website. <coughs> now, I also need to talk to you about who in, in, the, in the US and South America we should... There were individuals, what they did before, they had a lot of individual guys, which uh, Sunspace, who, who, who built the satellite, organized in the beginning, but they're not necessary AMZ people. And it was, it was a conflict. You know, somebody said, well, why him and not me and, and so on. So we said, no, hang on, let's go to the MSET organizations, ask them who would be the person in that part of the world. So in the U.S., most probably you have to have two, one for North, North America and most probably one for the, for the Southern Americas and, and operate it uh, as portion of the week. I don't know, but we'll see whoever you appoint as the person that I should deal with, I can deal with them the problem. But then... At, at the end, at the beginning of each month, we will have the whole schedule for the month. But it doesn't get uploaded like that. It gets uploaded only about three days in advance. Each, each, uh, they operate about three days. 
and then they upload the next lot and the next lot and the next lot. Well, it will be on the, on the, as I say, it will be on SAM's website, but I mean, I can copy your ANS editor. I mean, as simple as that. All right. Now, the next generation of South African student satellites is the next project I want to quickly talk about. And um, that is uh, the Cape Peninsula University of Technology, not as our friend from uh, ISASET, Cape Town University. It's the Cape Peninsula University of Technology, and it's a project with FSAT. FSAT is the French African Institute of Technology. And they have a mission to produce a growing stream of well-rounded students to address national human capacity development needs in space, science and technology through partnerships. Hey, I don't know who these guys get all these big words from. Anyway, the emphasis is on satellite engineering system and, and uh, it's being funded through the Department of uh, Science and Technology and the National Research Foundation in South Africa. Uh, they have some technology partners, Hermanus Magnetic Observatory, University of Stellenbosch, Clyde Space, ISIS and SAMZ. I think ISIS is the ones that's going to organize the launch. Well, they're having a meeting next week. The first mission is a 3U CubeSat, 10 by 10 by 30, and the concept uh, is driven by 30 students, selected payloads, the ADCS as proposed by University of Stellenbosch, the same one that they're going to use for the solar sail at, at, uh, here at, uh, sunny, uh, at um, sunny Space. And the timeline is to develop it and have, it, uh, have the whole thing ready by October 2011. We don't have a, a launch for that yet. But by 20, October 2011, as the Astronomical World Congress is, is taking place in Cape Town, and they want to brag with this thing there. All right, the CubeSet, you, you know all about CubeSet, so we won't go into that. This is what the structure looks like. And it has a camera payload, uh, which, um, which will be um, open. We're not quite sure. Uh, what format they will be using, but it looks like that uh, uh, that a standard uh, digital television uh, set or t a set top box we should be able to decode the pictures. HF beacon, now that's an interesting science payload in partnership with the Amonic Magnetic Observatory, and it will be used to characterize a space weather radar antenna array in the uh, in the Antarctic, the South African base there. It's part of the Super Dawn. Uh, network, which is the super dual auroral radar network, uh, orbiting signals, uh, they, they really need a, need a, a signal source, uh, 14 megahertz, we're not sure exact frequency, we'll need to talk to the HF people, will be used, and the carrier may be modulated with a tone, or maybe there will be some data, uh, that maybe of interest to radio amateurs, and the link budget will be uh, met with 100 milliwatt transmission. Now this is what the antennas look like, uh, the, this, uh, the uh, radar system of the Antarctic, uh, what you see in the white there is uh, snow. And uh, there was a huge gale, and uh, you know the antennas are all guide, you can't see it too well, <coughs> but they, they, all, they all sort of guide to one another. So what happened is, is that this huge gale came, this one fell over, and the whole lot went <laughs> So... What they decided to do is to rebuild it, but this time what they've d done is, is they've got poles and they have got, it's now all wire antennas. So obviously they, they, and it's very difficult to take pictures apparently in Antarctic. It's about the best picture that they had for me. And, and that's what they've got. Now what they want to do is, is these, these radars uh, looking basically at transitions in the ionosphere. And uh, so what they need is a 14 meter signal uh, that comes that comes across on the, on the, from the satellite to to be able to uh, to uh, uh, do some adjustment and to do some calibration of the, of those particular arrays. And apparently, once this uh, satellite happens, uh, the satellite goes up with, with that 14 megahertz transmitter. It will be used by the other super dons in the in the project. It's a huge worldwide project that's being used by all the people that watch space weather. And as you may have seen lately in in all the media that uh, even NASA is now becoming concerned that uh, they cannot handle all the space where the problems and the kind of well, say things we don't know about yet. So there's, there's quite, a, quite a big emphasis. But it's nice to, have, to, have, to be able to do that on the satellite. 
the transponder it's using existing L band and S band units. Uh, uh, there are two approaches. One is the simplest one is to demodulate audio and loop back to the, the, the transmitter and then re this require minimal hardware functionality or purely linear transponder uh, and then we need to add frequency conversion stage between the receiver and the transmitter. Uh, store and forward, straightforward store and forward AX25 9,6. I said to the university, for heaven's sake, think of something different. It's so boring. There's hundreds of those things going, and who's going to want to use them in the end? So that's what's happening at at um, uh, at uh, the University of, of the Cape uh, University of of um, uh, Technology. The other interesting bit is is that uh, in South Africa we also. We, there, there's a project which is being, um, being initiated between South Africa, Nigeria, Algeria and Kenya where they're going to put up free weather satellites or free, not weather satellites, but free, uh, uh, what, I, what do they call those things, Earth observation satellites. And South Africa has to build one and Nigeria is already being built and then between, uh, and Algeria is going to get one built. Kenya is only a participant in the in the project. Now there is an opportunity for SAMSAT to actually find space, like we did with some Mandela set, on the South African satellite because there is definitely space available, and hopefully we will build something complete and not piggyback on anything else. But you know, with governments, they take forever, and by the time that they actually give the contract to Sun Space, they must probably give us again three or four months. So we are actually thinking of what we're doing and we may take some of our, our CubeSet project equipment and actually put it on that satellite, the, particularly the transponder and then the CubeSet will take take on a longer position because we, we obviously uh, can't do both at the same time. So that's one opportunity and uh, that satellite is expected to be uh, around about between 600 to 750 kilometers uh, above um, the earth so you know it, it again it's like an SO67 or an Oscar 51, uh, basically. But, uh, you know, maybe it replaces some of the ones that will expire by then. Uh, the time frame, three to four years from now, when they plan to do that. The Algerian one goes up earlier. I tried to negotiate with them, uh, but they actually don't know what amateur radio is. So it's quite a big project, although there is, there is a guy there in their uh, armed forces that is um, very keen on amateur radio. And he is licensed, but I can't get any, any kind of like communication out of him. So we don't know what they're doing. Algeria, we're not sure what the position is. I believe they're having a conference later on this year in South Africa. And I normally get invited to, to when, the, when the conference is in South Africa, so we'll find out. I'm finished. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Hans. Um, we've got a time for a couple of questions. Are there any questions? Any questions on the web? Okay. Good. Must be very clear and explicit. Thanks very much, Hans. It's not very many questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really? I'm sorry, a question. On the web. On the web. From uh, Thomas, HB9SKA. What is the exact reason of, for this restrictive schedule on SO67? What is the exact well, uh, there's a simple reason for it, that the, SO, uh, that the SO67 is very much a piggyback payload and it, it always has to, to take uh, second or third position in terms of what the power availability is and that's why there's a restricted schedule because it can only accommodate so many so many passes and the, if you look around the world of a, of a 15 minute pass you you can't schedule too many in each day so right now it's it's in in eclipse maybe once it's out of eclipse again uh, we may be able to get more more uh, availability but uh, until such time as we now schedule it and and if it takes on the job uh, the sooner we get him going the sooner we'll be able to get europe covered again thank you Great. hence thanks very much once again